Thank you so much. Um, I would like to welcome you to our Minority Health and Health Disparities in Neuroscience webinar series once again. Uh, this webinar series offers the opportunity to share research advances, lessons learned regarding cross-cutting challenges and opportunities in the field. And so it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Casey Dieters, who will present on the investigation of well-established risk factors for cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease in Black Americans, plus a call for health equity research. Uh, before introducing our speaker, I would just like to let you know that at the end of the presentation, we will allow time for questions and discussion. And if at any time you have a question, please enter it into the question box um, right here at the bottom of your screen. It's marked Q and A, and I'll ask it on your behalf. Now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dieters is an assistant professor in the Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology at UCLA. Her research focuses on ethnic and racial disparities in predictors for cognitive decline and AD, ADRD in older adults, primarily from the Black uh, community. Her goal is to understand the intersection and contributions of genetics and social environmental factors to cognitive decline and AD. Her research program will utilize a number of techniques, including genetic, neuroimaging, neuropsychological assessments, social and environmental factors, and fluid-based biomarkers. And so without further ado, I'll turn the Zoom over to Dr. Dieters, um, and we're looking forward to hearing more about your work and learning more from you. Thank you so much, Molly. Uh, let me just get my screen shared. Okay, yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm really uh, uh, appreciative of the organizers for the Minority Health and Health Disparities and Neuroscience webinar series uh, for inviting me here to give an update on, you know, well-established risk factors for cognitive decline in AD in Black Americans and a call for health equity research. Uh, this is the longest presentation title to date that I've also had. So, <laughs> uh, there we go. So uh, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with this figure at this point, um, but this figure is a really great um, example of the biomarkers from Dr. Risa Sperling that shows the clinical stages of Alzheimer's disease dementia that exists on a continuum from cognitively normal to the preclinical stage where protein abnormalities can be measured to mild cognitive impairment where some memory loss is impaired to the person or those around them and these biomarkers to continue to become more abnormal. And then finally to dementia. And we can track the trajectory of these stages using biomarkers. The two hallmark pathological features of Alzheimer's disease are extracellular amyloid plaques and intracellular tau tangles, as shown here in this graph. Protein deposition begins decades before symptom onset, um, as shown in the graph. <laughs> For example, if we look at the red and green line, which represent amyloid and tau respectively, we see that abnormal levels are present in the brain before the MCI stage. Abnormal accumulation of these proteins leads to neurodegeneration, which we can also track using structural or volumetric MRI measures as represented by the blue line. Finally, we can see that cognitive impairment, which can be measured using an array of neuropsychological assessments um, as represented by the purple line. However, all of these biomarker trajectories were identified in mainly non-Hispanic white participants, which presents a gap in the field that myself and others are working to address, and that is what are the risk factors for cognitive impairment and dementia in the black community. There have also been a number of genetic risk factors that have been identified um, uh, for Alzheimer's disease, largely from genome-wide association studies or GWAS. What's shown here is a Manhattan plot and named so because uh, it looks like the Manhattan skyline apparently, uh, with significant genetic variants being the sky skyscrapers or the peaks here, and chromosomes are on the X axis. This, man this Manhattan plot um, shows the results from a recent very large GWAS of about 39,000 clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's disease cases and about 47,000 proxy Alzheimer's disease and related dementia cases, and just over 400,000 controls for cognitively normal older adults. The study identified some of the same genetic risk factors as previous GWASs have, such as APOE shown here, 
but also identified an additional 42 loci. Similar to the trajectories we saw on the previous slide, these genetic markers were largely defined in European population. And so the same question is posed as before, what are the genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease who have been racialized as black? In the last seminar series, um, a colleague here at UCLA, uh, Dr. and mentor, Dr. Elizabeth Rosmeda, um, showed this slide uh, from one of her, uh, her two, uh, 2016 publication, and that is showing the estimated racial and ethnic inequalities in dementia incidence rates in Kaiser Permanente Northern California health plan members. So as we see, Black individuals, American Indian Alaska Native, and Latinx participants all have higher incidence rates relative to a white group. So the fact that most of these risk factors, whether it be genetics, imaging, or psychological for AD dementia have been identified in white individuals is an issue considering that uh, Black individuals are at highest risk for dementia. And in line, again, uh, with what Dr. Amedis, um talked about uh, her last seminar, I wanted to continue to build upon uh, the health equity research goals that uh, she put forth. Ultimately, we aim to identify drivers of racial, ethnic, and other social inequalities in health to inform policies and programs to promote health equity. And there are current research efforts focused on describing health inequality by group and determining if, if these inequalities are larger or smaller over time. Further, evaluating specific risk factors and their contribution to health inequalities is key as I mentioned in the previous slides, because one size does not fit all. And by that, I refer to the notion that risk factors identified in white populations may not have the same effect in other racialized groups. So I'd like to start with an example that I've been using for a while, just because I think it's a, a beautiful um, example of how using biomarkers defined in the white population um, is not the same for non-white populations. So what I've shown here um, is, uh, graph from uh, Weave et al. from a uh, 2018 article that shows global cognitive uh, score on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. And we can see um, two things here. First, we can see at baseline that Black individuals have lower average cognitive scores relative to white individuals. And if you just look at one time point, uh, unfortunately, I think there have been some studies in the past that have alluded that Black have worse performance or just perform um, uh, uh, worse overall to white individuals. But if we look at the actual slope of cognitive decline, we can see that it's not different between Black and white participants, suggesting that the neuropsychological battery test that we are using um, across uh, uh, the participants are measuring cognition but uh, because neuropsychological tests were developed in white individuals, validated in white individuals, pretty much every other non-white group um, uh, just has lower scores relative um, to white individuals. So this highlights not only the racial bias in neuropsychological exams, but also the need for longitudinal studies in black cohorts. An example of this is a recent study that I um, should be have out pretty soon. <laughs> and that is looking at the COG state computerized um, uh, cognitive composite battery or the C3 battery. This is a computer-based test. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in computer-based tests versus pen and paper uh, because of the cultural bias that pen and paper um, elicits, including um, uh, that of education backgrounds. So uh, computer-based tests may actually reduce the language proficiencies that we see. So uh, there was uh, uh, recent publications by Gamaldo et al. that found that older Black adults were more satisfied um, overall and had less anxiety with computer-based uh, tests compared to pen and paper. And they also showed that um, they were comfortable, older Black adults were actually comfortable using a computer um, and did use a computer frequently. Uh, the C3 battery was shown to detect AD-related cognitive impairment, both cross-sectionally uh, cross and longitudinally. Uh, C3 is also associated with AD phenotypes, such as uh, cerebral spinal fluid, hippocampal volume, amyloid, um, but in white participants. And so, you know, it really leaves the question is how does C3 perform in non-white participants? Uh, and just to um, uh, show what the C3 battery is, um, you have three different memory tasks um, that are in the C3, but also the cognitive brief battery. Uh, this uses playing cards uh, to um, uh, measure cognitive function. So for example, if you see a joker and you're doing the one back test, if the next card is a joker, you would click yes for that card being the same as one back. 
these tests are measured um, differently, whether it's percent correct or accuracy um, uh, or reaction time. And so for this C3 study, we actually use data from the anti-amyloid and asymptomatic AD study or the A4 study, which was launched in 2014, the secondary prevention trial in cognitively normal individuals and provides the opportunity to explore um, uh, predictions of elevated amyloid in large data sets of cognitively normal um, individuals with PET. A lot of this work was done while I was at UC San Diego and there was a PhD student, Shinran Wang, who ran a lot of these analysis. And so um, on the y-axis here, we have the different uh, factors that were used in the analysis. On the, y, on the x-axis, we have the estimates and confidence interval. So anything that crosses this line is not significant. So we can see here that pretty much um, all of these tests um, shown here, like the face name learning test, behavioral pattern separation test, uh, were significantly different in black versus white individuals. Next, I also want to talk about genetic risk factors and how genetic risk factors are not the same in Black individuals. So in chromosome 19, um, chromosome 19 lies two genes that confer risk for cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease. First is the APOE gene, which contains three alleles, E2, um, which is thought to be protective, E3, which is the common allele present in the majority of the population, and E4, which is the risk allele for Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment which functions in a dose-dependent manner, such that two copies of the E4 allele confer higher risk um, than one E4 allele. Um, I did leave out the E2, E4 carriers from this because um, the risk of the genotype is unclear considering the protective and risk nature. Um, but if we look at the percentage of ApoE4 across different um, uh, ethnic and racialized groups, we can see the solid bars here are cognitively normal controls, while the pattern part by the pattern bars are individuals with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And we can see that black individuals actually have the highest percent frequency of the E4 allele um, compared to white individuals or Hispanic or Japanese. However, if you look at the pattern bars, so those with Alzheimer's disease, you see it's pretty similar to that of white. And you would think that if there's a higher frequency of E4 and E4 is this great genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, that would actually correspond to a higher rate of uh, Alzheimer's disease in black individuals, but we're not seeing that in a lot of different, oops, excuse me, in a lot of different studies. Um, so this suggests um, what not only this study was showing, but also numerous studies that E4 may have a, less of a, an effect on Alzheimer's disease risk and cognitive decline in people who um, are racialized as black. And um, I really like this example of translational work. Um, so this is work uh, from um, uh, University of Miami, and we can see that uh, this is showing APOE4 expression in people with African local ancestry or European local ancestry around the APOE4 loci. So local ancestry just refers to people who may have different ancestry at a specific region of the genome. And this is usually present in people who are admixed. So this especially applies to black Americans who have both European and African genetic ancestries. And so really, if we wanna get down to precision medicine, it's really important to take a look at um, ancestries or, um, at a specific loci as they've done here. And so what they can see, um, what they show here is that APOE4 expression, which is um, noted in purple, is actually lower in um, individuals with African local ancestry on E4. Uh, and APOE4 expression is higher in people who have E4 around the European um, local ancestry. And so the authors also note that the biggest change in this expression was seen in the microglia cluster. Um, I mentioned two genes. Um, another non-APOE risk gene uh, lies just upstream of APOE, and that is TOM40, or the translocates of outer mitochondrial membrane 40 homolog gene. Uh, and this gene functions to have a protein in and out of the mitochondria. There's a specific intronic poly T repeat SNP, um, I'm just going to call this 523 for short, that has um, poly T repeat, so T, 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 T that has been associated with increased cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease risk. So you can see the TOM40 length here on the x-axis and the count on the uh, y-axis. And you can see that it pretty much varies across um, individual as far as the number of Ts you have at this loci. Um, however, TOM40 is in linkage 
equilibrium within the APOE gene. And so a lot of research, which was primarily done in white individuals, when they did see the uh, investigate 523 with APOE, um, oftentimes they thought the effect of TOM40 was attributed to the great risk that APOE4 was conferring for Alzheimer's disease. And if we look at APOE TOM40 haplotypes, if we look at um, the TOM40 length in white and black individuals, you don't really see too much variation. Um, it looks pretty similar. Sure, there's maybe a few extra Ts that are greater than 40 in people who are um, identified as non-Hispanic Black. But when we look at the TOM40 variation by APOE background, um, we start to see uh, a pattern or a haplotype. And that is if you're white in E3, you have uh, poly T repeats less than 20 or greater than 30. And if you're E4 in white, you have poly T repeats between 20 and 30. So these are gonna be called short, long, and very long. Now, if we look at the E3, um, the APOE uh, haplotypes in black individuals, we see that if you're black in E3, you have a very similar um, haplotype uh, compared to the white E3 carriers, and that is um, poly T repeats between, um, that are short and very long. However, if we look at black and E4 individuals, we see way more greater variation in the poly T repeats compared to white E4 carriers. And so this really got, um, us thinking about what could this variation mean? Could it be contributing um, any type of protective or greater risk for Black E4 carriers? And so for this study, we use data from a Rush cohort in collaboration with Dr. Lisa Barnes. Um, we use data from three different projects that enroll at age 65 and older um, and without known dementia. So these three studies are the Religious Order Study, the Rush Memory and Aging Project, and the Minority Aging Research Study, which includes Black individuals from Chicago and surrounding suburbs. There's a really great neuropsychological battery that is given to all the cohorts, and so it's really great um, uh, to have uh, the rich battery uh, for neuropsych uh, neuropsychological assessments across so many different cohorts and for so long. Um, a lot of these people have been followed for decades. So the question is, is TOM40 associated with cognitive decline in APOE4 carriers, positive carriers? So um, first, you know, statistical sake, we had to group, we decided to group these by short. And so the color here coordinates to the color on the graph. So um, if you were short, short, it's represented in red. If you are have at least one short allele present, it's represented in blue. And if you have no short alleles, it's represented in the gold color. And as we can see, if you do have if you are black and E4 and do have a short allele, you had a significantly slower rate of cognitive decline relative to black E4 carriers without a short allele. And then when we compare this to white E4 carriers, if you remember there's no variation, this is just categorized as long um, for 523. Um, we see two things that I alluded to earlier. First, that white individuals have a higher intercept for global memory relative to black individuals, but also, if we look at the slope um, between white E4 carriers and black E4 carriers who do not have a short allele, they're actually not statistically different. But what is different is the white E4 carriers and the black E4 carriers with a short allele, suggesting that this group of black individuals may uh, potentially protect, be protected against um, the detriments of E4, or at least at a slower rate. There are also non-APOE genetic risk factors um, on top of TOM40 that a lot of people have identified. Uh, and this includes the largest uh, genetic um, or the largest GWAS uh, to date on people that have been racialized as black. And we can see that there have been some identification of uh, new novel common loci or rare loci, and some that have been repeated um, uh, that were identified in a previous GWAS of African-American individuals uh, here, including ABCA7 and APOE. Oops. Uh, additionally, using another, measure, uh, another method called admixture mapping, uh, the authors identified two loci associated with Alzheimer's disease. And further analysis of this interaction between local ancestry and genotype so th showed that loci at this chromosome 17 or this pink um, uh, peak was associated with lower risk for Alzheimer's disease in Black individuals. And this peak, the Black peak shown here at chromosome 18, actually showed higher AD risk for Black individuals. So again, just using that local ancestry to identify um, whether it's the European or African ancestry that may be conferring risk uh, for older Black adults. 
And so in the past few slides, I have been talking about genetics, race, and genetic ancestry. And I think it's really important to understand these terms before diving more into this research. Unfortunately, people have inappropriately correlated race with one's um, biological background. I 100% race is not biological. It is a social category. It is social, not biological. That has been forged historically through oppression, slavery, and conquest. Um, however, I do think, um, especially in America, race is important as it may capture some important epidemiological information, such as uh, socioeconomic factors, racism, discrimination, um, and factors that are heavily determined on structural racism and, and discrimination that have led to the systemic policies, such as redlining. Um, so for example, race or more appropriately racism can influence every aspect of a life from um, of life for people of color, from healthcare to education and green space, such as parks and other community resources. Genetic ancestry, on the other hand, correlates more so with geographic location since the, cat um, the catalog of genetic diversity is gathered from people who live in one area, which also leads to the question that I won't be exploring today, but um, you know, is genetic ancestry also reflective of environmental factors and potential epigenetic changes? Additionally, um, while there are folks out there working hard to change this, there's a lack of genetic diversity in reference panels. So um, as of now in the GWAS, um, for example, GWAS catalogs, about 80% of the GWAS data is of European descent, while only 2% is of African descent. And calculating genetic ancestry is dependent on these reference panels. So understanding the difference between race and genetic ancestry is really crucial for ethical research when we're studying, um, when we're asking questions relating to um, health in the black population. Another thing that is different between black um, and white individuals is postmortem neuropathological insults. Uh, I really like this graphic that Dr. Lisa Barnes from Rush University put forth um, and has been replicated in some other studies. But that is looking at um, uh, the pure AD neuropathology and that pure narrow AD pathology being um, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. So as you can see in white participants, there's a, a larger percentage of um, uh, postmortem neuropath that shows pure AD in white individuals relative to black individuals. While black individuals are more likely to have comorbidities, including Lewy body and um, infarxis cellular death or tissue necrosis. Additionally, going, you know, going back to you know, looking at amyloid and tau as these main or pathological um, hallmarks, only recently, as you can see by um, the dates here, you know, really just uh, started um, getting these publications uh, in around 2019, <clears throat> excuse me. We see that on average, <clears throat> excuse me, Ken, uh, individuals have been um, identified, uh, or these studies have shown that there's been lower tau, um, both in CSF and um, plasma uh, for black individuals relative to white. However, uh, there's been some discord in amyloid findings, uh, whether it's been no difference, higher difference, or lower difference. So this led to another study um, using the A4 data. Uh, while I was at Stanford with Dr. Uh, Beth Mormino, and that is looking at amyloid and clinically normal older cohorts. <clears throat> and so preclinical Alzheimer's disease uh, is when there's cognitively normal, but amyloid positive is about 30% of the 70 year olds. Uh, there's greater risk of future memory decline and dementia. And so we're really focused on this, these people here um, before they have, um, uh, again, any type of uh, cognitive abnormalities. However, it's unknown if these findings do translate to non-white populations. So using the data from A4, uh, on the y-axis here, I've shown continuous amyloid SEVR, and on the x-axis, we have APOE genotype. And uh, just remember, E4 is a risk allele, so this is post, um, having two E4s is associated with higher risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease or cognitive decline relative to having one E4. And then I've shown the levels of amyloid in both black and white individuals. And before I get into these results, I would like to know all those I'm showing continuous amyloid. I did do these analyses also in dichotomous amyloid and um, saw the same findings. But overall, you can see that if Black individuals within each genotype, um, apoid genotype group, had lower uh, uh, amyloid relative to white individuals, 
But what's interesting is that this was only significant in the E4 carriers, suggesting that E4 can't possibly be that large of a risk factor um, for Black individuals if we're seeing significantly lower amyloid in Black E4 carriers, as opposed to the general population of Black E3 E3. So again, we have um, more proof that E4 does not confer the same risk for AD phenotypes in Black participants compared to white participants. I also looked at African ancestry. Um, this was on the global, not local. Um, I do hope to do that in the future. But um, I looked at global African ancestry and, and sought to determine if that was associated with amyloid. So as shown here um, on the y-axis, we have percent ancestry that's increasing. And then we just have individuals in the A4 study that identified as black on the x-axis. Each person gets a value for one of these five um, uh, ancestral groups. And so each person will have one color for each column. So for example, this person here who has about 28% of African ancestry also has around 90% European ancestry. And I did organize this by increasing African ancestry. And you can see that pretty much throughout the entire A4 cohort for people that identify as black and do have amyloid imaging available, this African ancestry exists on a continuum, and that is from around 30% up to 90% or up to 80%. And the exact inverse is European ancestry. So when looking at ancestry in relation to amyloid SUBR, which is shown here, and this is residualized for uh, demographics such as age, sex, education, um, and APOE status, uh, we have African ancestry on the x-axis um, increasing. And as we see with increasing African ancestry, we see decreasing amyloid and decreasing and lower amyloid um, is quote unquote better than having higher amyloid. And of note, this um, association of uh, decreasing amyloid with um, higher African ancestry is actually independent of APOE, suggesting that there are independent effects between ancestry and APOE in relation to amyloid. And so yet again, We've shown that even though Black participants are more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, genetic ancestry may influence Alzheimer's disease risk factors. However, I think it's really important to know about selection bias um, that may occur in the cohort studies. Um, so I wanted to look at selection bias in the A4 study. There are about 6,700 people that underwent screening, both neuropsych and medical. Uh, about 4,500 um, 4, people completed the amyloid PET study, and there are about 2,200 um, individuals with no amyloid PET. Out of these people with no amyloid PET, um, they failed screen for a number of reasons, whether it be medical reasons, clinical um, dementia rating, mini mental state exam, or logical memory. So um, when looking at the screen fail rate into the A4 study, we see that indeed black people were more likely to fail, screen fail out of the A4 study relative to white people at almost twice the rate. And when we investigated why black individuals were um, screen failed out of the A4 study, it was more likely because black individuals were more likely to have lower cognitive test scores relative to white individuals. And as um, I mentioned earlier in the talk, you know, these neuropsychological tests are, are created and validated in white individuals. We know that there's these intercept differences between um, uh, overall scores. And so um, without proper normalizing, um, which is also a contentious thing, um, a, a topic of debate, but that some type of method to, um, you know, better investigate neuropsychological testing um, at one time point, I think black individuals are going to continue to be excluded from um, you know, these really important uh, clinical trials that are, would, be, would benefit from the diversity. Alternatively, white individuals were more likely to be excluded because of too high of cognitive test scores. So um, you know, a question is how can we address racial bias in these current neuropsychological testing? And while I just covered a lot on PET imaging, I also wanted to cover um, this, uh, some work by a recent public, uh, some work in a recent publication by Dr. Indira, Indira Turney from Columbia University that covers brain aging and markers of neurodegenerative diseases using MRI. 
So Dr. Turney uh, showed lower cortical thickness measures in black individuals in later life. Um, and of note, these two colors represent um, the offspring study, which is representative of midlife, and the YCAP study, which is representative of late life. Um, and this is a cohort, um, these are quotes from the Manhattan, Northern Manhattan area. So um, yeah, again, Dr. Turney showed that lower cortical thickness measures in black individuals later in life, while um, vascular burden measured by white matter hyperintensities was higher or worse in black individuals in both midlife and late life. Um, the age differences as uh, shown here do suggest, uh, sorry, as shown in here, do suggest that uh, black individuals were more likely to have accelerated brain aging relative to the white and Latinx groups. And so this kind of brings back to the um, health, the goals of health equity research um, that we began to talk with. And, you know, what are drivers of health and equity? Um, while I believe all of these stem from policies, you know, from systemic racism um, and structural discrimination, it's still important to note what are potential factors that are driving this. And um, this brings us back to the health disparities research framework from Dr. Carl Hill. Uh, uh, that has been a really great way to look at psychosocial factors that we can use to understand risk and resilience factors that impact uh, racialized communities across the lifespan. So let's not only focus on biological um, you know, um, factors contributing to decline, but also environmental, sociocultural, and behavioral factors that are more likely to impact um, uh, the Black community. And I really, uh, I, I really like this example from Dr. Crystal Glover, uh, who's at Rush University, that used this framework in action, um, who, who used it to organize um, uh, the different factors that can be uh, uh, associated with perceived stress um, and look at the factors on different levels, um, including, again, the environmental, sociocultural, behavioral, and biological framework. Also like to highlight how amazing the um, Mars study is from Rush University. There's just a wealth of data, as you can see here, um, that is available, um, you know, to, to pursue these type of questions, these research questions. And so um, uh, after investigation, uh, the authors did see, I've kind of blocked out what was not significant, but a lot of these different factors actually were associated with perceived stress in the Black community for people, um, for these cohorts from Rush University. And these analysis um, identified both positive and negative correlates of perceived stress um, and provide evidence for uh, related factors um, that fall under this disparities research framework. Uh, and something, again, that I alluded to earlier, what drives a lot of these health disparities, and that is structural racism. Uh, Dr. Atkins, Paris Atkins Jackins, Jackson, <laughs> or AJ, um, uh, is a, a brilliant, amazing uh, scientist who is really leading the pathway for structural racism and um, really making sure that us as researchers use the correct methodology um, to measure structural racism. Uh, she has two really great papers out um, uh, that cover, you know, just a background of information in this and um, not only tying structural racism to biological processes, but just in discussing, you know, previous research from that. So, um, experiencing racism is, is obviously going to cause um, stress um, in a person's life, anxiety, um, which can lead to uh, impact biological processes. And uh, there's another paper um, in the Journal of Epidemiology by Dr. Adkins Jackson that um, has a list, and this is abbreviated list, this is not the full list that is in the article, but list of recommendations of measuring structural racism by suggestion required action. And so, for example, do not use race as a proxy for racism, um, but instead use variables that capture multiple dimensions of structural racism and includes required actions. I think it's really great that somebody you know, has really dedicated um, a, the, most of the research to studying this one thing and, and is telling us how, or is, is trying to help show us how to use this measure appropriately in our research. And there's a very, very, very recent publication that just came out, I believe, in January this, this month <laughs> um, from Dr. Laura Zahodny using data from YCAP, and that is looking at discrimination and MRI measures of brain aging. Um, so I, I talked about Dr. Turney's work looking at um, brain aging between Black and white individuals, but now we're looking at just racial discrimination in Black individuals from those same studies. And we can see that um, uh, 
uh, oh, and sorry, this was over uh, 221 non-Hispanic black older adults from the YCAP study. So the study showed overall that lifetime discrimination was associated with lower hippocampal volume and everyday racial discrimination was associated with greater hippocampal volume. Thus, going back to that, um, uh, the previous slide, we have an example of how experiencing racism or discrimination can lead to stress, which can have an impact on biological processes, including biological processes that are, affect brain regions specific to Alzheimer's disease. This leads me to um, one of the final goals of the day, and that is implementing health equity frameworks to enhance participation of historically excluded populations. So oftentimes racialized groups are blamed for lack of participation in research studies, when in reality it's the institution or the researcher who has not put in the work to target these communities. Again, I go back to the phrase, one size does not fit all, and that includes research participation. Um, the work that you know, we're doing uh, to increase research participation is often geared toward white individuals without taking into consideration um, uh, the life of, of marginalized groups, including the Black community. So I myself have often heard that it's too hard. One too many times we're referring to recruitment and retention of racialized communities. While I haven't actively done this work myself, but I plan to in the future, I'm very thankful for research like researchers such as uh, Dr. Andrea Gilmore, Bikowski, um, and colleagues, um, including Dr. Lisa Barnes, Dr. Manley, who have been doing this work um, for years and for decades, um, and have given us a pathway uh, on, how to, on how to do it. There are publications on, on you know, that have laid out the practices um, to help increase research participation for minoritized groups. Um, so as purported in this publication, um, inclusive research is the ethical imperative of justice. And this includes focusing on inclusion and exclusion practices of research participation. An example of one of the models is shown here and is called the Participant and Relationship-Centered Research Engagement Model, which focuses on the needs of the people. Um, so for example, um, and I really like how the author does, the authors do know that these stages are not mutually exclusive or necessarily sequential, but comprise a set of ongoing foundational practices for facilitating equitable research participation. This is such a great paper that really covers a, um, a lot of different as, uh, research aspects for inclusivity. Um, and so, for example, th this framework talks about relationship um, with the participants, inclusive design, including inclusion and inclu exclusion criteria, accessibility. Um, you know, for example, if somebody doesn't have a car and, you know, your institute is far away, being able to provide um, the financial time, the transportation and other logistical challenges that are unique to the population that you are trying to um, uh, hopefully help and engage. Um, fit, openness, um, and eventually readiness, readiness for the participants uh, to be able to um, just, you know, re receive the data uh, from the research studies. And so this kind of leads me to overall the, um, again, why research in the Black community is important. And um, again, Black Americans are disproportionately more likely to have cognitive impairment and dementia compared to white individuals, but whiteness continues to be centralized in research. Again, going back to this GWAS catalog, where about 80% of the GWAS data is, is um, uh, European, with only 2% 2, 2 being um, from African ancestry. And this is really important because the United States is becoming more diverse. For the first time, they're actually seeing a decline in people who identify as white in the United States, while there's an increase in every other marginalized group, including, um, uh, especially within the Latinx or Hispanic population. So there's really a need to bring justice and equity to research practices within the Black community. This also leads me into me launching my career at UCLA. Um, I just started as faculty here last July. And so I am still in the midst of building my lab and getting my research out. So while I have some really interesting um, research I wish I can show, um, it's not presentation ready yet. <laughs> um, but the goal of my lab is really just to understand the intersection and contributions of biology, genetics, and social and environmental factors to brain aging and Alzheimer's disease in black individuals. And um, I hope to utilize a lot of the tools that I've, I've shown in this presentation, including um, social environmental factors, genetics, um, ethnicity, and um, racialized groups, and also looking at different brain aging, um, whether it be through white matter hyperintensities, looking at different patho uh, pathologies, um, PET, uh, plasma, 
and of course, studying neurodegeneration and how all of this impacts cognition and Alzheimer's disease. And while I am new to UCLA, I wanna highlight um, some other people at UCLA that are doing some really great research in this area, including one of my mentors here at UCLA, um, Dr. April Thames, um, who has an R01 uh, looking at lifetime stress and cognitive aging in the context of HIV. Uh, the goal of this research is to summon, uh, determine how lifetime stress exposure, including discrimination and social adversity, contributes to cognitive aging in HIV and HIV um, seronegative adults. And so this is using, again, a wide, uh, a wide number of um, techniques, including questionnaires, neuropsychological testing, MRI scans, and blood draws. Additionally, along with myself, there have been two new recent hires who are also doing health equity research in some non-Alzheimer's disease areas, including Dr. Addis Mendizabal, who's in the Department of Neurology and Institute of Society and Genetics, um, who's focusing on health disparities in Huntington's disease and other neurogenetic conditions. And again, focusing um, on social, uh, social factors such as adverse childhood experiences and how that impacts um, these diseases over time. Uh, Additional, additionally, Dr. Jennifer Adrissi, who's in the UCLA Department of Neurology, um, whose uh, research is looking at access to specialized care and clinical research opportunities for Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and how does this uh, investigate contribute, contributes to racial and ethnic disparities in access, but also the community-based participatory uh, research um, uh, yeah, another model for health equity framework to develop and analyze community partnered interventions. And finally, um, while this isn't necessarily a racial or ethnic disparity, LGBT, LGBTQIA obviously applies to everyone, um, anyone who identifies as this. So this is severely underrepresented in aging and Alzheimer's disease research. And when I started hearing about this uh, research from Dr. Uh, Jason Flatt, who's at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, I was really intrigued by this work because this is something that I didn't think about. Um, just like in the beginning of my studies, uh, the impact of structural racism is not something I thought about. Um, so I really hope in the future that I can incorporate uh, understanding this disparity, um, LGBTQIA as underrepresented group in the context of black individuals as well. And also you'll be hearing more from him as he is the speaker for this seminar series in April. And finally, I have to recognize Black and Neuro. Um, I am part of the Black and Neuro organization um, and Black and Neuro's mission is to diversify the neurosciences by building a community that celebrates and empowers Black scholars and professionals in neuroscience related fields. Um, there's a wide variety of events that we have. Uh, every July, there's a Black and Neuro conference. We have weekly, or I'm sorry, monthly seminars um, uh, throughout the academic year, professional development workshops and um, different socials. And so finally, a lot, I'd like to just thank everyone who's helped me with this work. Um, this includes people from, uh, a lot of this work I showed was from Stanford, um, UC San Diego, and I'm new to UCLA, so I'm still building collaborations here. <laughs> um, and of course, a lot of the key collaborators um, who have helped me along the way. I also don't have any funding yet as an API, so I just put older funding here who has uh, helped to support the previous research. And of course, I, being a woman in science, being a woman of color in science is never easy. And I have the most amazing mental health and academic warriors that I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for them. So I always like to take a few seconds out of every presentation now to just thank the people, the scientists that I have in my life that have helped support me um, and literally gotten me interviews um, and, and networking opportunities that I wouldn't have. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and um, I will take any questions. Can you see that was fantastic and this doesn't happen very often, but as you're presenting, I have a ton of ideas for uh, future webinars. So thank you okay. so much <laughs> for your presentation because you covered so much everything from, you know, looking at how we recruit people um, to mm -hmm. put files, um, what to consider as we're recruiting, you showed data on the lower um, cognitive scores. But I believe the A4 trial, that research also showed that uh, many uh, Blacks may have been excluded because their amyloid levels were lower, I believe, than the non-Hispanic whites. Um, and then you talked a, a lot about the importance of disentangling race from genetic ancestry. 
which is so important. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have a ton of questions um, in our Q&A and um, I want to encourage our audience to keep them coming, but a lot of these uh, questions are going to cover on some of the issues um, that crossed my mind as you were presenting. So we're just going to move right into the questions. Um, the first one is, um, hello, I am a DRPH a doctoral student studying public health. My interest is in Alzheimer's disease related dementia and an African American woman. So do you have suggestions on where I could find related secondary public data sets to do further research on this topic? And I think, you know, Casey, towards the end, you talked about the great social network of women scientists <laughs> you have supporting you. And so mm -hmm. I think that's also going to be important for, um, a, the, I don't have the name of this person, but can you talk a little bit about how you went about getting, making those connections, um, you know, and getting access to data that would, um, that helped you in your career. And this is important for us to think about too, from the NIH side, given the new data sharing um, policy that has been implemented. And if mm -hmm. this individual wants to reach out to me, they can, and I could probably um, help in that regard. But go ahead, Casey. Yeah, sure. So I think there's two questions there. I think it's one about networking and then also about finding secondary data sets. Um, and so I think studying uh, sex and gender disparities, as I alluded to at the end when I was talking about Dr. Jason Flatt's work, is really important, um, uh, especially when studying the Black uh, community. Unfortunately, um, most, uh, most study Black cohorts are very women heavy, there's more a higher percentage of women than, than men. So I think actually, well, I guess not unfortunate, but um, actually studying, you know, different risk factors within uh, black women, I think is, uh, uh, is something that is very much needed. Um, so unfortunately there isn't a large number uh, of cohorts, black cohorts, um, as I think uh, we're, we're aware of. I do think that, um, the data sets that I've seen that have looked at uh, different gender differences have been the Minority Aging Research Study from Lisa Barnes, and then the YCAP study um, uh, out of Columbia with Richard Mayhew, um, Jennifer Manley, Adam Brickman, uh, who heavily use these uh, data sets. Um, but these require DUAs, um, collaborations, putting in data requests. So um, as far as just uh, secondary data sets that you could just download. Um, I think ADNI, uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, and the A4 study that I talked about in this study, they're both available uh, for download um, from the, the LANI website. Um, but other, otherwise, I think this really just goes to the point that we actually need a lot more work in, in increasing our um, cohorts with Black individuals for, for these for this, um, set. So, um, it wasn't probably the best answer for that question, sorry, but unfortunately there just isn't like a, a really great big cohort um, outside of the ones I mentioned um, or aggregating across the cohorts. And then as far as networking from color, um, I will definitely say I, <laughs> I followed a lot of people at conferences. I would see somebody that looked like me um, and I would literally try to follow them until I was able to tap them on the shoulder and ask them a question. Um, and then I, you know, through, through, through that, I was able to get <laughs> a lot of the collaborations and networks I have. Additionally, while I was at Stanford University, um, the percentage of Black postdocs wasn't different from, you know, the rest of the country, but Stanford has a large number of postdocs. So, uh, you know, by that, there was just a lot more Black postdocs there. There's about 45 of us when I was at Stanford, which is a lot of Black postdocs in one area. After being at Stanford and being a Black postdoc, it spoiled me. I had so much support from Black individuals. I have been seeking that everywhere I go. So typically when I do see um, any, any people of color um, at the universities I'm at, I really do try to introduce myself, send an email. Sometimes I'm shy, um, but I really do try to at least open the connection um, uh, between it. And I'll have happy to say too, at UCLA, I've been able to, um, I mean, I'm in a group chat of, you know, black faculty here and it's been really great. Um, sometimes we're more active than not, but it's been, um, you know, somebody has to put forth the effort. And if that's you, then you have to be that person. Um, you know, you get out of it what you put into it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Mm -hmm. 
Casey, you are very lucky because I have never been anywhere where there was more than one or two uh, Black or African American <laughs> scientists throughout my graduate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> It, it was yes. pretty amazing. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I know some other questions. <laughs> okay, um, there's another question here. Has um, COD State developed tests with potential ethnic cultural biases in mind? And if so, which strategies have they used to develop and validate these tests? Yeah, so something I didn't talk about when I was doing the C3, because no matter how many presentations I get, I still get nervous and sometimes I skip important details. So I'm glad this question was asked. But I do think that the Cox State um, was was developed um, to be, uh, you know, like culturally unbiased the best it can. And what I um, didn't focus on was the actual like education variable. And I think, you know, there's a lot of education is a big driver of cognitive differences, um, especially between um, black uh, individuals and white individuals. And one thing that the Cox State did do is it did actually reduce that education variable. So although we were still seeing um, ethnic and racialized differences, um, in the C3, education variable actually was not significant anymore, which suggests that it's still, it is taking out some of the bias we do see, but unfortunately there is still some cultural bias that remains. And so um, I think it's still important that, you know, I know there are people out there doing it. Um, I am not a neuropsychologist. Um, and so it's, I'm, you know, I'm, I always say I'm learning. We're all lifetime learners, I guess, as scientists, but um, uh, I, I really think that um, uh, more, more work needs to be done uh, to create culturally free tests. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for that. And thank you for that question. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Amofa Ho. Um, I have a question about genetic differences. Is it possible that the lower diagnosis of AD among Black Americans is due to access, evaluation, and diagnosis? I'm not sure what is meant by access evaluation, but I'm just gonna take a guess and um, the person can comment again if, if not. <laughs> but um, so I, I don't think there's a lower diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease as, as we showed um, from the graphs from Dr. Elizabeth Rosemeida um, and, and from a lot of other individual studies, Alzheimer's disease is actually um, more diagnosed in black individuals. Um, and so uh, sometimes it's, you know, due to misdiagnosis, I, I, I'm not, um, I don't know that I can speak more, more on that, but um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to fully answer that because it's higher diagnosis in, in Black individuals, but I do think that um, just to get back to, I guess, genetic differences in Black individuals with Alzheimer's disease. I just think that there are other, you know, again, and as shown by the GWAS studies in the paper by Kunkel and by the other work by um, Rajalbi and, and uh, Jeffrey Vance's group um, in Miami. Uh, I just think that there are other genetic factors that we're not paying attention to um, because it's overshadowed by, uh, Euro by the European groups, European genetics. Um, European ancestry. And so um, having to tease apart that local ancestry um, is going to be really, really important. Yeah, um, I agree. And uh, I'm sorry, did I cut you off, Casey? No. Okay. Yeah, no, this is some uh, work that's ongoing within the um, Alzheimer's disease sequencing project um, group. And I believe that's um, some of the research that you showed um, emerged uh, from that uh, work. So mm -hmm. yes, very important for that work to continue um, and for you and others to continue it. That's great. Um, Dr. Hyacin um, has a question. Although a social construct isn't race used in research for ex explanatory power context since genetic ancestry is a bit more complex to explain. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think they give us different information. Um, and I just think what I what I really wanted to draw attention to is the appropriateness of using race versus genetic ancestry. Um, again, I, I kind of, um, when I was talking about the race and genetic ancestry, I said, this is very specific um, to black Americans because this is where I've done my research and where, you know, I, I've, I've, so I can't speak to um, other national, other nationalities. But for Black Americans, you know, who have been here for generations and have, um, you know, uh, experienced redlinings and then the consequences of redlining, for example, um, 
you know, it's like zip code, right? Is is all and and um, uh, neighborhood disadvantage is is such a big uh, determinative fa determining factor for cognitive health over or just overall health, I should say, right? Overall health, yeah. and so um, sure you could attribute that to race, but genetic ancestry also is going to I think be very important when it comes down to precision medicine, um, especially for Black Americans who are highly admixed. Um, and just referring back to that uh, chart where I showed African and European ancestry and how they're um, like in in. Uh, can't think of the word right now, but <laughs> um, for opposite of each other. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I think the main point I wanted to get across with that was just that when using race or using genetic ancestry, it's used appropriately. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And with you. also I wanna specify appropriately being not filtering out people because the genetic ancestry doesn't match their self-identified race. Right. I think that's an example of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because real personalize or precision medicine is taking everything in, including the, the person's experiences based on how they self-identify also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's a follow-up question too from Dr. Heisen. So in Nigeria, we use the terminology of Blacks and non-Black uh, for this purpose, not necessarily the same way it may have been used in Western societies. So how do you propose better communicating the nuances of ancestry versus race, especially in lay communities. Yeah, I'm gonna take a page out of uh, people like uh, Dr. Atkins Jackson um, or AJ, and you know, using the term racialized, people racialized as black. I think that's very specific that it is a social construct um, being race. I don't know how to further describe that, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so, so same terms, you know, somebody's racialized as black. Um, that is usually a social construct because somebody views you as a certain thing. And, you know, and that kind of goes to term black versus African-American. Um, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, theories of, you know, a lot of people have their own, you know, definitions for these things, but, you know, black is just more inclusive to people who are socially identified as black, uh, but has nothing to do with ethnicity or nationality. But when it comes to America and how, how access to healthcare, you know, racism, discrimination, all of these different social factors, that's going to have a play. So I hope that, um, yeah, hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a related question from Dr. Rosenberg uh, who mm -hmm. wanted to know what does the term race, racialized mean? Yeah, so racialized as in it is society who has termed you as a Black person. They have looked at you, they look at your skin color, it is visual, um, you are different than me, it's racialized as Black. Um, just like somebody who can be racialized as white um, or racialized as Hispanic. Um, so it's just really focusing on the term race, which is a social construct racialized and, and kind of putting that all um, together. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Leah, I believe, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, how do you propose we can make cognitive tests more culturally sensitive and inclusive to all populations? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm gonna have to pass on that one because I am not a neuropsychologist. Um, <laughs> I do pretend to be sometimes. Um, I'm attending INS this week, which I'm really excited about um, to learn more, but I do not know that answer. Um, I do think, you know, obviously increasing um, uh, black uh, presentation and cohorts, um, things that are specific, uh, not having potentially stressful things on test. Um, you know, there's a great paper out about, um, you know, uh, from Jennifer Manley and others talking about, you know, the use of the noose and the BNT. So just go in, I think even just going through the, the current neuropsychological test and just making sure there's nothing like that in there. Um, but yeah, I don't have a full answer for that. So I'll- Great, <laughs> <future> webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, future. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have time for one more question. And let me, before we go, apologize to those of you whose questions I haven't gotten to. There are a ton in here. Um, we could certainly save these questions and then maybe send them um, off to you, Casey, um, and see you know, how we could communicate the answers um, to our audience, uh, whether mm -hmm. that's through our listserv. Um, but the one question um, that I could ask here is from Dr. Uh, Mumber. Um, great presentation. Can you comment on the inclusion and access for rare neurodegenerative disease 
um, genetics, clinical trials, access, etc. So that's quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know how to comment on it other than you know going on that on that pedestal again about I think this is up to the institution and the researchers that need to put in more work and um, for for creating a more inclusive. Uh, environment when it comes to, you know, clinical research. Um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like that's pretty much all I could say right now, but I really think it's up to the researchers to, 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 to do more work. Um, and again, you know, there are people out there who have laid out the framework um, for this. And so, um, you know, inclusive research, not excluding um, uh, minoritized individuals based on uh, white established norms. Um, I think is a big one. So um, I'm kind of, you know, I know that there has to be exclusion criteria for things, but I, I and I'm still learning about this, um, uh, but I'm more so like we should never exclude people of color because they're always excluded. And if, you know, if they're already wanting to volunteer and, and help, um, that's a point of access for, for us to, to learn more um, for, from them and to help them and, and to engage with them and, and hopefully be more in the community. So yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Thank you for saying that. Okay, um, a lot of comments that of people who um, love the social network that you've built. Um, so that's great. Um, and just to let everyone know, this um, talk was recorded, and we will make the recording available to all of you. Um, there were lots of great resources, um, papers, manuscripts that were referenced that I've had the opportunity to read it, and I could tell you some great research that was presented. So once again, thank you so much, Casey, for your presentation. It was outstanding. Thank you um, so much. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, can we put up the last slide? Um, Casey alluded to this in her um, presentation. So thank all of you for your attention and for your active participation in today's webinar. Um, and we will just like to advertise our next webinar in April. As Casey stated, Dr. Jason Flatt will join us to talk about the sexual gender minority uh, population. And we're so happy that our colleague from the Division of Behavioral and Social Research, Dr. Melissa Gerald, has agreed to join us as the moderator um, for this webinar. And so we're looking forward to another great presentation. And we're looking forward to all of you joining us once again. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and have a great day.